I've been trying to find the perfect trivia board game to adapt to a classroom setting for a very long time, and after many failed attempts, I have finally found it. Today I'll share with you how I used this game, why it was so engaging for my students, and why this is the best board game I've adapted to classroom play, here on Legendary Tactics. Occasionally there are moments of synchronicity when my real life job as a teacher merges with my after hours passion board gaming. If you're like me, you've no doubt thought that board games could be a great way to engage students, and you'd be right. In my quest to find a game that is at once educational, fun, adaptable to a full class setting, inclusive, and also perfect as an initial minds on hook or as an end of class re-engagement tool, I tried many games, but none really checked all of the boxes. Until this one. For my film class, the Family Feud edition was solid, but it just didn't work with non-film classes. So I tried the Trivial Pursuit Stuff You Should Know game. It showed promise, but ultimately it was too obscure for most people and the gameplay didn't really work that well. So when I found my holy grail of board games, I wanted to be sure to share it with you. So here are the top 10 reasons why A Game of Wolf by Grey Matters Games is the ideal game to adapt to your classroom. I got my copy at Indigo Chapters in Canada. For the questions I show in this video, I'll be sure to also give you the answers at the end of the video, so if you really get into them, you can find those answers. Feel free to pause the screen at any time if you want a taste for what kind of questions the game offers. Number one. First, I love that this game is interdisciplinary. It covers history, geography, English, pop culture, science, music, film, sports, and many more subjects. From an educational perspective, I'm really happy that the knowledge students get from this game is not limited to my subject, which is English. For example, the Elemental Words card asks, what word is created when combining the atomic symbols for each element? This keeps the game interesting if you do one or two cards at the start of every class, because it appeals broadly no matter what subject students enjoy. Number two, the game is inclusive. It really adapts well playing with five players or with 35 players. And while the game is intended to be a collaborative effort, it can be played individually with each student recording their own answers. To play, they just need a slice of paper and a writing stick. And this gets every student ready to go at the start of class. Whatever your demographics are, there are cards for everyone in the class that span across different cultures, times, and places. It's also great for many different grade levels. Anywhere from grade 6 up to adults is ideal if you're somewhat selective with the questions you use. This leads to my third benefit of the game. Since there are a wide range of questions, different students emerge as winners throughout your class. Every day, someone new can shine, whether it's the one who has arcane knowledge about chemical formulas or the worldly traveler who knows obscure geographical facts. For those who don't win, they're rewarded with a small snippet of learning. It's really nice to shine a spotlight on different students each day. By the way, if this video is helpful to you, I really appreciate it if you take a moment to like the video and subscribe to our channel. My fourth reason for liking this game is just a little bit selfish. This game's set up so that the teacher can play too, as long as you're honest. If you want to be part of the experience, you most certainly can be. The answers are on the back of the card, so that allows you to be involved. The questions are also varied enough that you likely won't win all that often when you're up against 30 kids. It's great to be able to pit your knowledge of Star Wars up against theirs. It might even give you a little street cred. Number 5. More important than me liking the game though is that the students love it. At some point, I thought that students would be tired of this at the start of each class, but every time I asked if they wanted to keep playing throughout the semester, they always said yes. I paired this up at the start of a class with a quotation that we discussed as well as a dad joke to add levity. This triple pack was a really nice way to start each day. Depending on what you're teaching, some of the questions can be great discussion starters and can also be connected to your curriculum. A question on the size of an Easter Island Moai might lead students to asking where they came from or how they managed to move such monoliths. A question on Shakespeare might lend well to a discussion about knowledge questions and whether students agree with them or perhaps an, as an introduction to what a paradox is. How can a person die many times? I'm glad you asked. Number seven. I had a lot of luck using this game at the start of a class, but in a different class it was also a great tool for the last five minutes of a class if student engagement is waning. Many times students wanted to continue doing questions even after the bell rang. That's a really good sign. So whether you want to start or end your class strong, or even use it in the middle of the class, this game offers a strong engagement opportunity. Number eight. 
Though some questions are really obscure and I would never use them, others are great little tidbits that are good for students to learn. For example, they can learn about the main ingredients in particular foods or about various dog breeds or my favorite, famous Shakespearean quotes. This cultural literacy can be a nice supplement to the main curriculum you're teaching. It's the kind of question that students might take home to talk about at the dinner table with their families. And to get a sense of how easy or hard these questions are, try this question on Ancient Ruins by pausing your video now. You can compete against me for the tiebreaker for the Ancient Ruins question. My guess will be 66 tons because six is my favorite number and it's also ridiculously high. I don't think anything would ever be that heavy, uh, but you never know with these questions. So uh, let me know in the comments if you manage to beat me on that one. Number nine. The mechanic of this game that really makes it work well is the tiebreaker system. Questions one through three are usually fairly easy, but questions four and five offer much more of a challenge. If you have a few students who manage to get all five or they get tied at four, it doesn't happen that often, but the tiebreaker is a number that students select and most of the time you just need to make an educated guess, which means that anyone can win. And this adds a sense of resolution to the game when one of the players is able to rise up. Number 10. Lastly, I love that I was able to use this game casually in the hallways or at lunch with colleagues too. It's a really nice way to bring people together. I didn't use the sports trivia with my students because it just felt like it just wasn't the right place to use that, but I did find that colleagues really enjoyed competing against one another as they battled to show off their arcane knowledge of various sports. If there's a game that you've had luck adapting to your classroom, please share it with me in the comments. I'd love to hear about it. And if this game works for you, I'd also love to hear about that. If you found other innovative ways to integrate it, that would be wonderful. Thanks so much for your time.